So in this unit, we're going to be talking about impressions and toolmark evidence in forensic science. Some of the information that we're going to cover here, we've already kind of covered in fingerprints, so some of this may seem a little redundant, but fingerprints are a kind of impression. So some of the same lab techniques you would use for fingerprints, you would also use for other impressions. So we're going to review patent, latent, and plastic impressions. And we're going to look at how we would compare impression evidence from a crime scene to a known impression and look at the individual characteristics of tool marks. So an impression is any indention or marking that is formed when an object is pressed against another material or surface. And you can use it to link a suspect to a crime or uh, link it at least to the object or tool that made the impression. And depending on what the material was that the impression is made in, it will be a different type of impression. So you can find impressions in things like blood or dust or soil or snow. <clears throat> now we have uh, talked about the type of impressions before. There are three types. The first one is called patent, which means it's visible. And this is what you get when the object is placed in something opaque and then the impression is transferred to a different surface when that uh, object is placed on a new surface. You can find patent impressions um, such as tire treads or footwear treads or tool marks or teeth marks. And you may find them in dirt or in dust or on a roadway or in the case of teeth marks, somebody's skin. Plastic impressions are also visible, um, but they are a three-dimensional impression that is made on a soft surface. So you can have plastic impressions of teeth marks, of footprints, of footwear, and tool marks, depending on what the impression was made in. So you can find plastic impressions in things like the skin or mud or snow or paint or soap if the impression is deep enough to be three-dimensional. And then we talked about latent impressions a lot when we talked about fingerprints. So these are invisible to the naked eye and usually made by oil or perspiration on a surface. They are the most common and most valuable type of impression evidence. And they have to be developed either physically or chemically using things like fingerprint powder or chemical reagents or UV light. You can get latent impressions from the, your fingerprints, your palm prints, and the soles of your feet. And almost all surfaces in a crime scene have the potential to have latent impressions on them. For footwear impressions, if it is a patent impression, then you would just take a photograph with it with a high resolution camera. If it is latent, so let's say somebody walked through blood and then cleaned the blood up, you would use a chemical like luminol to make the footprint visible and then you would photograph it. You can also dust for latent impressions uh, for, from feet and palms, the same you would do for fingerprinting, and then you'd photograph and lift them. There is also a technique called electrostatic dusting and gel lifting. With electrostatic dusting, the, there's a film that is placed over the impression if it's made in dust, and then... Uh, you run a current in through the film, which causes the, the, the dust powder to adhere to the film, and then you can let, lift it and um, image it with a, with a special light source and photograph it. With gel lifting, instel, instead of it being an electrostatic uh, charge, there's a layer of thick gel um, in between a paper backing and a plastic sheet. And this is good for... Th um, uneven surfaces because it'll mold to the surface. You would dust the print, peel off the gel uh, plastic cover, press the gel down, and then lift the gel off the print and replace the plastic cover and then you can photograph the print. If you have a plastic impression in something like mud or snow, you're going to want to cast it. If it is something in sand or dirt, then you can use plaster of Paris. Um, although that technique is 
kind of going out of vogue. You would spray the impression with hairspray to protect against the impression of the plaster. And then you have to make kind of a thick concentration of plaster of Paris and you would pour it into the impression. And you can see in the picture in the bottom left, they put a um, fence around the impression to keep the plaster from going everywhere. And then you just let that harden and then you can pick it up. And so there's an example of what that would look like um, on the right. If it is snow, you can't use plaster pears because plaster pears is hot and will melt the snow. So you have to use dental stone, which is the same thing they use to make casts of your teeth if you're having a, a partial or a bridge or dentures made. Tire treads are another type of impression evidence that can give us a lot of information about, especially car accidents. We would want to collect them at the crime scene. We can identify the type of tire and possibly the make and model of the car that made the impression. Um, we can also look at the impressions and figure out how the vehicle was driven and how the accident occurred. Tread patterns do become unique to the car that they're on because there are certain imperfections in the tire, there's wear patterns to the tire, and you pick up small rocks in the grooves of the tread that can make the tire tread unique. So this is also considered a type of pattern evidence. You can use tire treads to also place a suspect at a scene of a crime. So tire tread impressions are uh, classified as either skid, yaw, or tire scrubs. Skid impressions happen when you brake suddenly and your wheels lock and you literally skitter along the ground. So looking at the skid marks, you can determine how fast the car was moving and how far they had to brake over. Yaw marks are formed when you take a curve too fast and the vehicle skids sideways. It creates a high temperature on the road surface because of the friction and the tire and roadway melt together. And then tire scrubs are caused when damaged or overloaded tire impacts, so um, burst basically. And these become very curved or irregular in their width. And you may even have striations within the impression because if you've ever worn a tire down to the um, threads, you know what that looks like. It's going to scratch the road. So you can use tire scrubs also to determine the point at which the tire failed. If a tire tread is patent, such as it ran through a pool of oil or a pool of blood and then left the tire tread, you can photograph that with a high resolution camera. If it is a latent impression, which you will normally find on sidewalks or roads or driveways, you can try to do an electrostatic dust lifter like you would with footprints. Um, you can also use gel lifting. And then plastic impressions, you would make a 3D impression of it the same way you would do for foot impressions. So either using plaster of Paris or dental stone and using hairspray to protect the impression before you add the casting material. Um, den uh, dental impressions, so bite marks basically, can either be classified as paint, plastic or patent. You wouldn't see latent dental impressions very often. And depending on how deep the bite mark is, is what differentiates it between being plastic or patent. So in order to collect a bite mark, you would photograph the bite and then you need to swab it for saliva for a possible DNA profile. Then you're going to make a cast from the bite mark using uh, dental stone or micro seal. And then you can do a impression of the suspect's teeth for comparison, although the science on this is not very widely accepted. If you're collecting tool impressions, you're most likely dealing with a, with a forcible entry scene, a burglary, a break-in, something like that. Tool impressions are also usually patent or plastic, depending on the depth of the mark, and you get them when the tool and an object make contact. If the object is a softer surface, um, you will get striations on them that will match the surface of the tool that made the striations, so basically scratch marks. 
There are three types of tool marks and they're considered class characteristics. So these are applied to a general class of tool. You have indentation marks, which is a negative impression of the tool making the mark. So it's as if it got stabbed into the surface. There are abrasion marks where the, uh, the tool slid across the surface and made a scratch. And then there's a cut mark, which you get when the, the edge of, when the tool that made the cut, made the mark, has an edge on it. So a knife or scissors, etc. So when we are collecting tool mark evidence, you would want to photograph it with a measuring device so you have a scale to refer to. And you can use an oblique lighting to highlight the, the mark to make it more visible. You can also use magnesium smoking on a dark colored tool where you basically take magnesium and you light it and the magnesium powder, like the magnesium oxide powder that's caused by burning it, coats the surface of the tool to enhance its details. You can also cast an impression mark made in a surface using microseal, which is a silicone or rubber-based casting material. And then you would have a three-dimensional uh, impression of the tool to compare to if you find a suspect tool. Um, so indentation marks are also called nicks or depressions and are usually made by trying to pry something open. Abrasion marks you often see with things like pliers, knives, axes, and gun barrels. And sometimes you can have indentation and abrasion marks made at the same time on the same surface. And then cut marks you would see with knives or saws or wire cutters and usually on things like wire bolts or hinges or locks, something you tried to cut through. Um, you can also see it on bone if someone tried to use some sort of saw to cut up a body. The tools themselves can be categorized based on their action. So it's five categories, compression tools, flat action tools, gripping tools, shearing tools, and slicing tools. Compression tools get their name because they put pressure or impact a surface. So you're looking at a hammer or a chisel and you, with a hammer, you'll get an indentation of the surface of the head of the hammer. And with a chisel, you'll get striations along the surface because the chisel usually works at an angle to the surface. Flat action tools work parallel to the surface and include screwdrivers and pry bars, which will result both in indentation and abrasion striation marks at the same time. Gripping tools have jaws used to grip things so that you can turn them. So we're thinking about vice grips or pliers and they will also produce indentation marks and striation abrasion marks as part of their action because you're gripping and then you're turning which is going to scrape along the side of the surface. Shearing tools have two blades adjacent to one another. So you're going to end up with two cut marks. So that's scissors and wire cutters. And then slicing tools have a single sharp blade. So that's something like a knife or a razor. And that's going to be a single cut mark on the surface. If you are trying to test a suspect tool to try to match it to a impression you collected from the crime scene, you need to consider what action is employed on the tool. How do you normally use it? What part of the tool is used? How much force was used on the tool and the direction and the angle that the tool was used. So you need to replicate, try to replicate all those things to get a good comparison sample. So in collecting tool marks, the first thing you want to look at is if there's any trace evidence on the tool because that can give you additional uh, information about the crime or make more connections between at least the tool and the scene. So for example, if you find red paint chips in the teeth of a tool, then you can try to find where the red paint came from. Second, you need to figure out, do you need to fingerprint test this? All right, so you, if it's patent or plastic or latent, you would do the appropriate procedure for collecting them and then you photograph and record keep those. Then 
You're going to lift those fingerprints if present or remove the trace evidence if present so that you have that evidence to process and compare. And then finally, you're going to use a comparison microscope and you're going to match up the cast of the impression from the crime scene with a cast from the tool mark you made and you, you have to get them like lined up same direction same magnification on both sides of the microscopes all of that has to be calibrated calibrated correctly and you have to have the same orientation of light so with our microscopes we've seen you can either have it coming from underneath or coming down from above um, in this case you want them both coming down from above most likely and then you can look at them and see, do they share enough characteristics to say that they match? 